No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today, and I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to be with us. Let me tell you what's coming up on today's program. We'll begin with our devotional time, which consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of that scripture. Today we'll be looking at Proverbs 1, verses 8 through 10, where King Solomon introduces the Proverbs that he wrote for his son. So get out your Bibles, turn to Proverbs 1, and I'll meet you right there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, Freddie Clayton will be with us, and he's walking and talking in the light. His segment for today is simply entitled, Simply Christian, and we'll find out what that's about in just a few moments. Jim Dearman's in the studio with his sound words, as he is for every episode. Today, he'll be explaining what we gain through baptism. Then Roger Campbell will be with us, and he'll be answering the question, what should Christian parents want their children to know about Jesus? That's a segment that every parent will want to hear. And then our final segment, Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin will be with us repairing our understanding about Romans chapter 13, verse number 8. They'll answer that from the Word of God as they always do. Well, I hope you have your Bibles opened up to Proverbs 1, where we read together. My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. passage for today comes from the beginning of the book of Proverbs, where Solomon is encouraging his son as he introduces the book uh, of wise sayings. Now, this is Hebrew poetry, which is a little different than English poetry. You know, our poetry has, has meter and it has rhyme, and that's really part of the essence of, of English poetry. But in Hebrew, it was more of a thought process, which happens to translate to other languages fairly well. And here we have the Hebrew parallelisms, different ways of saying the same thing. And he talks about, my son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. He's talking about instruction that we need to listen to our parents. Now this implies that mom and dad are saying the same thing. They're on the same page, which is what they should do. And that page, the no number one job of mom and dad is to raise their children to be faithful Christians. But too often times we lose sight of that fact. And we try to raise our children to be professional athletes more than faithful Christians. Sometimes we raise them to be very interested in riches. They'll be rich more, more uh, monetarily, but morally they'll be bankrupt. Or we may raise them to academic excellence, but spiritual mediocrity. And some parents are focused on raising their children to be their best friends, 
rather than raising them to be faithful Christians. The result of this, the blessing, is these lessons that mom and dad teach will be an ornament on their head or a chain about their neck. The illustration here is, is fine jewelry, something that you're proud of. And the things that your parents have instructed you in are things that you should be proud of. I can think back of some of the things my parents taught me. The value of hard work, treating strangers with kindness and respect, save up money for a rainy day. One of my dad's favorites, keep your eye on the ball. This is really where we form our identity. It comes from our character. The text goes on to say, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Those things a sinner is trying to get you to do are against what your parents have taught you. Solomon goes on to warn about the consequences of following evil companions here in chapter 1. So as we look at this, we need parents who will teach the moral lessons to their children. We need children who will continue to live by those moral lessons and be faithful to God in their own lives. And one of the most important lessons for our children is that they become a Christian and live a Christian life. You become a Christian through hearing the gospel message, believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing His name before men, and being buried in baptism for the forgiveness of sins. When you do that, you can have that blessing of being a child of God, and that is good news for us today. Now, Freddie Clayton joins us, and he's encouraging us to be simply a Christian, walking and talking in the light. Many people are growing disenchanted with present religious forms which originated in the Middle Ages and have become meaningless. There is a displeasure with denominational structures and dogma. Some, because of such views, have even decided that genuine Christianity is not even relevant today. We believe they have made this decision because they're not sufficiently acquainted with the Scripture to be able to distinguish between the gospel of Christ and what men over the centuries have attempted to add to it. If some of these things have troubled you and you have felt a yearning to return to the simple, uncomplicated religion of Christ, stripping away all the non-essential elements of religion and simply abiding by the truths of Christ, truth which transforms the soul and binds us to God, let us suggest that it can and has been done. The Bible, God's Word to man, presents Jesus Christ as the Son of God. He was foreshadowed and predicted in the Old Testament, which God used to govern His people until Christ should come and establish the new covenant. Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning at verse 31 through 33. That New Testament reveals the religion of Christ. By studying it, we will learn all there is to know of the way of Christ. We learn that among the followers of Christ, there existed no denominational organizations, whatever. All began at a latter time. In the New Testament, we see people hearing the gospel and obeying the conditions of God's grace. Thus being saved, they were added by the Lord to the Lord's church. Acts 2, beginning at verse 36 through the last verse of the chapter, verse 47. As the gospel spread, we find them assembling together in congregations in various localities. Each congregation was under its own elders, Acts 14 and verse 23, and no one else on earth. These elders could not make laws and be masters. They were given the responsibility of tending and caring for the congregation as shepherds. What a flaw. Acts 20 verse 17. The only headquarters these disciples knew was heaven, where their head, Jesus Christ, was and is. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. The worship was something in which to participate, not something to watch. On the first day of the week, for instance, they would eat the Lord's Supper and they would hear preaching, just as we read occurred in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 29. They would all pray with various ones leading 
and they would share in their mutual edification and responsibilities by sharing their prosperity. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. We find no collections and contributions being taken on any other day other than the first day of the week and no hierarchy taxing them or telling them how much to give. They had no organization clamoring for their support. They gave as they individually purposed in their own hearts, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. In all this, they were all necessarily involved for each saved person was and is a priest, Revelation 1, 5 and 6. No one could, afford, could perform his service or worship for another. They lived godly lives. They cared for the poor. They taught others. They sent out preachers to teach others in far communities. With simplicity of faith and fervor, there was no need of centralization. Without organized machinery, the gospel was preached to the whole world in a very short time. Colossians 1 at verse 23. These disciples of Christ were known as Christians. Found three times in the New Testament. Acts 11 and verse 26, Acts 26 and verse 28, and 1 Peter 4 at verse 16. They wore no sectarian name. Their religion was not materialistic or sensual. They did not seek to impress men with pious ceremony. Rather, they sought to impress God with the only thing that has ever impressed Him, a contrite, obedient heart. Their appeal was not social or recreational. They offered the gospel, for they knew it was God's power to save. Romans chapter 1 at verse 16. And any other appeal was beneath them. Many say, oh, if, if only such could be today. Friends, it is. Free men and women over the earth have despaired of denominationalism, seeing in it unnecessary division, and revelance that only causes division. They desire the simplicity of what Jesus authored, and their number is increasing. How many have taken such a stand? Who knows? They are related and connected only in Christ and not in some organization with machinery to keep a tally. We will not even try to number them. What is important, though, is that within minutes of where you are, there are Christians. They are worshiping and serving God the same way the early disciples did. Christ is their only creed and the Scripture their only guide. They are not members of any human organization. They are simply a congregation or a church of Christ. They, in turn, would like to share Christ with you and with all the world. Friends, you too can be just a Christian serve God without belonging to any denomination, bound by any denominational laws or obligations. If such freedom appeals to you, please contact us. This is Freddie Clayton walking and talking in the light. Now grab some paper and something to write with so you can enroll in our free Bible correspondence course. All of our courses are given absolutely free of charge. We won't try to sell you anything and we won't pester you with solicitations. After that, Jim Dearman will be with us right after this brief break. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Good That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1 877 384 7221. That's 1 877 384 7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. I hope you got our contact information. If you didn't get it, you can get that from our website, gnttv.org.
Now here's Jim Deerman with some sound words about a thorough baptism. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. My wife enjoys working crossword puzzles. On one occasion, she was doing a puzzle where the clue given for a nine-letter word was thorough baptism. Thorough baptism. The word was immersion. Think about it. The puzzle defined thorough baptism as immersion, a burial. That means any type of baptism other than immersion is not thorough baptism, according to the crossword puzzle. Well, according to the Bible, immersion is not just thorough baptism, it is the only baptism known in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 6, Paul wrote to those who had been thoroughly baptized, We were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. Thanks for that biblical explanation of baptism, Jim. There are many ways that you can keep good news in your life today and every day. You can see any of our programs or individual segments anytime you want on our free apps for your phone or tablet or our Roku or Apple TV channel. We've also got full programs available on our YouTube and Vimeo channels. You can also hear good news today on Truth.fm, which is a group of internet radio stations that stream 24-7. We have two podcasts that are available wherever you get your podcasts. Good News Today Daily Devotional Time and Good News Today Weekly. Now, Roger Campbell joins us to answer the question, why should Christian parents want their children to know about Jesus? Be ready always. If you are a Christian parent, then one of the thoughts that crosses your mind is, what do I want my child to learn about Jesus? If someone comes to you and confides in you and says, I've been wondering about this, how can you help me? What answers would you give? Well, first of all, let's remind ourselves of this truth. As parents, it's our responsibility to teach our children God's book and about Jesus. It's not the role of the civil government. It's not the role of the public school system. And I appreciate every Bible class teacher that has a role in teaching children. But that's just... That's the gravy. That, that's extra. That's supplementary. The number one responsibility, that's parents' responsibility to teach their children. God told the children of Israel under the law of Moses, you, you take my law and my instructions and you teach these things diligently to your children. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7. And Christian fathers are charged to bring up their children in the nurture or the training and the admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6 and verse number 4. So what should we want our children and our grandchildren to know about Jesus? I understand this is a really basic topic, but it's hard to overestimate how important that is. I'm going to give you three answers, and they all begin with the letter S. As Christian parents... We surely want our children to know that Jesus is the Son of God. And so the first word that starts with S is Son, Son of God. After Jesus was baptized and He was coming up out of the water, there was a voice from heaven, and God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, Matthew 3.17. When Jesus stood before Jewish authorities and they said, you tell us, are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? And Jesus said, I am. Mark 14 and verse 62. We want our children to know that Jesus is the Son of God. Number two, we want our children to know that Jesus is the Savior of the world. There's no guesswork involved. Why did Jesus come into the world? Paul answers that question, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He didn't come into the world just to make it a better place. He came to be our Savior. 1 John 4 and verse 14, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So we want our children to know that Jesus is the Son of God. Number two, that He's Savior. Number three, that He's superior. He's superior to everything and everybody. He lived a perfect life. He was tempted at all points like we are, but he lived without sin, Hebrews 4 and verse 15. Superior in power, superior in authority. And one day, every person is going to be judged by Jesus. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of the Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. All parents everywhere need to teach our children, Jesus is the Son of God, He's the Savior of the world, and He's superior to everything and everybody. I'm Roger Campbell, and this has been Be Ready Always. In just a moment, we'll be repairing our understanding with Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin. They both work with the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies, which is a free online school on the collegiate level. The next semester begins in early January, so it's time to register for classes. Check out their website at nwfsbs.com. We'll be right back with them after this brief break. Now, Guyton and Troy repair our understanding about going into debt. Does Romans 13, verse 8 prohibit debt of any kind? Troy, you know one of the things in life that really frustrates me when I look back? Uh, what is that? The amount of money I've spent on cars. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, I don't say that because like, like I'm wealthy and I collect them, but early in life, I, I always you know seem to trade cars more frequently than I should have. I got upside down in them and I had an older man one time tell me, he said, you will grow out of that. And, and I was folding bulletins with this older couple that were very frugal. And she explained to me that her husband, and I was shocked, uh, early on in life was the same way. And I was like, really him, but he's so frugal. And, and I learned if I can get a car paid for and just keep driving it till it falls apart that I'm much better off than trying to trade them all the time. Okay. That's, that's good advice. But there's, it has to do with the question today because it actually, the question that we, we were given says, does Romans 13, eight teach that financing a car is a sin and you know, just answer it simply. No, no, it doesn't. In fact, cars are not mentioned in the Bible. So, <laughs> you know, but could it apply to, to, to in, financing a car or something else? Certainly. And there's, there's in principle. Room. Yes. Yeah. And there's a lot of Bible verses we could talk about that actually give us warnings about borrowing and lending money. That's right. But uh, this is specifically asked about Romans 13, 8, so let's read it. And I really want to back up in context. And uh, so I'm going to actually talk to, um, uh, let's start verse 5. How about that? Okay. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For, for, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers. Now I'm going to stop there for just a second. They being God's ministers is talking about the powers that be going back to Romans 13, one through four. And so he goes on and says, attending continually upon this very thing, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, owe no man anything, but to love one another 
for he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. So in context, what he's actually talking about is our relationship to other people, specifically to those which are in some position of authority. That's right. And he's saying, you take care of your responsibilities to them so that it doesn't hinder you when it comes to being a Christian. That's right. And this goes back to like verses like, let your yay be yay, your nay be nay, mm-hmm. um, because we don't want to be a hindrance to the name of Christianity. Exactly. And do all things in the name of Christ. I mean, we, we need to we need to make sure that what we're doing is reflecting uh, Jesus in our life. This really falls in the realm of prudency or those, those questions of, of wisdom or questions of judgment. And so this is, you have to kind of take the principle. The Bible doesn't specifically say what we're supposed to do on that. As you just outlined so well, you use words like you got upside down. Oh yeah. And, and, and words like being frugal. Well, those are all learned things that happen through principles. And as you mentioned, even in the Old Testament, God was trying to help his people understand these principles. You go to, for example, Exodus 22, 25, Leviticus 25, or even Deuteronomy. And and in all of those verses, it talks about interest. Mm -hmm. And so there was money lending that was going on, but God even specified not to charge interest because he understood some of the the, the things that men would do in regards to that. And so it comes down to a matter of judgment. Yeah, but because everything we do as Christians should be about, one, keeping our word. Yes. Two, how we treat other people. Yes. That we're, and, and even in this verse, it, it talks about the idea that um, uh, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. How can we treat other people, uh, James chapter 2, the way that we would want to be treated? Yes, and this all has to do with stewardship as well. We always got to remember that we are to be good stewards of what God's given us. So is it wrong to to borrow money? Well, it's a matter of judgment and, and how you're doing it. Exactly. And so to the specific question, does Romans 13, 8 forbid us from borrowing money for a car? No, but are there biblical principles that we should certainly apply about making sure that we fulfill our commitments, that we are good stewards of what God has given us? Then, then yes, those biblical principles exist. Amen. Thank you so much for being in our audience today. You may want to listen to one of those segments again. You can get that on our apps or on our website. Maybe you'd like to ask us a question or enroll in a Bible correspondence course. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for being part of our audience. And remember, we love you, we're praying for you, and we want you to get to heaven. Always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. Good news, good news, the world. Always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. All around the world, good news, good news, the world. Always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today.